Hello everyone, this is Ross, the most influential blog on education in the UK here at Teacher Toolkit. Today, um, I'm on a three-way podcast, very exciting, it's the first for me, and I'm delighted to be joined by Sean Quinn, Head of Psychology at King's Eli Senior School in Cambridgeshire, England, and also Dan Geeson from Lesson Up, who is the founder and CEO of a fantastic EdTech product. So we're going to see how we get on with bouncing questions both their way. But let me just bring them both in first, one at a time, just to introduce themselves to our listeners. And I've got a couple of questions for you, chaps. Um, so, you know, who are you? What do you do? And give us one interesting fact, non-educational, about you and your life. Okay, so let's start with Sean. Hi, I'm Sean Quinn. Um, I've been head of psychology at, at King's Ely for 10 years now. Uh, prior to that, um, I was a prep school head in Berkshire at Bearwood College. And prior to that, I taught for seven years in America in a, in a school for kids that had been um, pretty much thrown out of uh, mainstream education. Okay. Um, interesting fact, um, I was once sent to Hawaii to... Uh, stop a group of coaches complaining about the conditions out there. Right. That, well, the, the, the Americans teaching things quite interesting, but so is that. So I might come back to that story later. Right. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Dan, how are you? Good. Good, Ross. And yourself? I'm very well. Yeah, I'm excited to catch up with you. And I know we're doing a bit of work later today and, and see how, how, how Lesson Up is reaching teachers all around the world. Before I kind of spoil your party, uh, tell us who you are, what Lesson Up is, and something interesting about yourself. Yeah, very cool. Uh, well, I'll start with the super interesting fact about myself. I originally come from uh, uh, more the retail business, and actually at a certain moment in time, I developed and uh, designed and produced my own shoes. Oh, what, what kind of shoes? Uh, well, the neat gentleman shoes, I would say. All right. Well, I'm a size the good uh, ones. 12 and a half, uh, size 12, if I <laughs> get put in an order okay let's get out of it um today everybody um we're gonna unpick the principles of rose and shine so uh, one or two people will be very familiar with that maybe it's new to you also but it's a piece of research from 1982 by a chap called barrett rosenshine who recently passed away and published a great piece of research which was drawn upon his 40 years uh, of, of working in the education field and I'm going to particularly pick on, on Sean in terms of his insights and how he's used the principles uh, in his work. So I guess I'll start with you, Sean, with a quick, quick fire question, I suppose. When did you first discover Rose and Shine yourself and how did it make you think as a teacher? Um, so it's been a school initiative for us for probably just the last two years. And um, prior to that, I, I wasn't really aware. And you know like all teachers perhaps you know another initiative another bit of research another new mm -hmm. idea and, and on the surface you know it initially seemed you know quite straightforward um but i think when when you dig beneath the surface and start actually kind of accounting for the principles more concisely in your lessons there's there's a lot of uh, merit to be gained from from sticking with it and, and mm -hmm. building your lessons around the principles and uh, so my next question was on the, the kind of, you know, off the fence, sceptical or optimistic. So uh, you, you mentioned that, you, you know, the, the usual with teaching, we're, we're very busy, time poor people and there's another initiative. So how long did it take you to kind of veer away from initial scepticism towards, oh, this is really refreshing. And, and how is that, I guess, Rose and Shine dialogue playing out across the staff with other colleagues? Um, I guess, you know, a lot of it's a little bit like my position, really, that, you know, some people, um, as always, really buy into it and some people won't buy into it at all. And then there's that, that gap uh, in the middle, that space in, in the middle. Um, I guess for me, it was kind of, you know, it, we broke it down into the principles. So each each few weeks we would introduce a new principle and, and kind of when you see the headline, it's like, well, of course I do that. And then the next time, of course I do that. But actually, when you start to really unpick your lessons, um, how often are you doing that and how, how much in the lesson is that happening? Mm -hmm. um, and then then I think you, you really start to see um, that, yes, you do do all of those things on occasion. But can you honestly 
kind of put your hand up and say you do all of those things most of the time and and you know i i wasn't and now i'm increasingly mm -hmm. i'm trying and, to um, to what, do that what how, what are your colleagues kind of reporting in in terms of how they've kind of uh, absorbed the research I, I would say similar to me as as in all schools that there are people that are that are really buying into it and and really trying to to change with an open mind and then mm -hmm. there are people probably still a little bit stuck in that place that i was well, mm -hmm. of, course, of course i do this there's nothing wrong with my teaching it it all works and i think no matter what you try and introduce that's that always seems to be the position for me yeah and i i guess in your role you know head of psychology and being immersed with that kind of cognitive science i guess this piece of academic research, re the academic research kind of confirms or validates what you do as a teacher which is uh, you know the kind of art of teaching in in some respects yeah absolutely and and you you do see you know it's a simple use of psychological research that that's accessible you know mm -hmm. to to all teachers it's it's not overly complex it's broken down um and it's presented in a very usable um tool-like manner so i i think you know exploring it is is a very valuable exercise um, so we'll come back to the, the principles in a moment, but I'm going to bring Dan in here. Dan, now um, in in the ed tech sector and you know uh, outside the UK, I guess a couple of initial questions to you: How familiar are you, are you with Rose and Shine, and how have, if you are aware of Rose and Shine, how have those principles be uh, are, are they in to lessen up? And maybe just tell us quickly what lesson up is. Yeah. So to begin a bit with lesson up. I think uh, pre-COVID 2015 uh, by Kars and Janneke. Uh, Kars from a tech uh, developer perspective and Janneke more from, uh, from the educational perspective. And they, they literally created together with uh, two other teachers, they created a, a lesson up over the years, of course, because their first product, their MVP was literally not working uh, that well. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, they really decided to go more into the back of the classroom to really see what they could add value to. Um, and lesson up was actually the end result of that. So I think in 2019, we really had a good product mm -hmm. uh, that could serve as a lot of teachers, uh, specifically here in the Netherlands, uh, where we're based. Um, and since our platform was immediately available also in English, uh, we got sign up ranging from South America until Japan, literally. Um, of course, COVID really enhanced our product um, and our services and our platform, but initially we were used or uh, designed uh, to be a product really to use in the classroom. Um, and that's what we still are. Um, I think Rose and Shine was immediately, since we had two teachers aboard, Rose and Shine was immediately part of the whole process of the platform, you know, to make sure that all, perhaps not all of the 17 principles, but at least we could connect certain types of questions or uh, certain uh, features of our platform really to, to the Rose and Shine uh, principles. Great. So that's good to know. So we'll unpick that and how that works, I guess, mechanically, if that's an appropriate term to use in terms of the software. Uh, Sean, I'll come back to you. Um, now, I'm going to assume that people listening to this podcast and maybe watching this video version uh, are familiar with the Rose and Shine. And if you're not, people listening will include the links. But uh, I'm going to assume most people are who are connected with Teacher Toolkit. But Dan, uh, uh, sorry, Sean, uh, on my travels, um, I, I visit a lot of schools and probably a good half to three quarters are familiar with the work of Rose and Shine. But very few teachers can... They, 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 they understand the value of the 17 principles, but very few can recall what they all are. So I guess my question is, how have you broken them down into a kind of memorable teaching loop? Are there any key themes that you can return to that make it a, a, bit, a bit more of a memorable sequence? I know that's a tough question, but um, let me see what your thoughts are. So we're, we're basically operating on the amended 10, 10 principles um, and I don't really have a have a trick or an acronym or a way of, of grouping those together and I, I don't really mm -hmm. um, kind of feel that, that, that I should or have to um, I just have grids available to me and mm -hmm. all the time and then when I use the product the lesson up product I just cross check that I'm I'm meeting meeting those requirements and if they're not mm -hmm. there I'm I'm building them in um, so 
I, I don't think you know that there's the need to kind of memorize them. I think there's engagement elements, there mm-hmm. is pre-planning elements, there's scaffolding and modeling elements, mm-hmm. and, and, and beyond that, um, I, th- I think you know that, that it would be not good use of time just to kind of be recalling them. Uh, ad- sure. Ad- Oh, um, so let me just go, I'm just going to refer to the 10 principles, and th- these are from the 2010 paper from Rose and Shine. So number one's the daily review, so the kind of do now or the retrieval from last lesson. Stage two is the present the new material using small steps. Uh, for people listening, stage three is ask questions. Then we move on to provide models. Stage five, guide student practice. Number six, check for understanding. Seven and eight is obtain a high success rate. So if you're posing a question and checking for understanding, make sure you have lots of students responding rather than one. Then stage eight is offering the scaffolded resources for your differentiation. And then stage nine and 10 is the independent practice, the guided practice with a weekly and a monthly review as you move through the the material. So Dan, I'm going to come to you now. So Sean talks about how he... Um, re- uses lesson up where appropriate to embed some of the rose and shine principles. If I choose one uh, kind of maybe stage where a teacher could ask a large number of questions and get a higher response rate, how does that work? I said mechanically earlier, how does that work practically in lesson up for teachers to pose lots of questions to the students in the class through your software? I think um, the best thing is with lesson up what you can do, you create a lesson um, and in the lesson you can add uh, different types of slides. Um, so to begin with the first one, the short review, what we uh, advise a lot of teachers to do, for instance, is to start with a mind map. So you can recall immediately on um, to activate the prior knowledge of, for instance, of last time. Um, and actually last week or this week I applied it in Belfast myself I was uh, teaching a master class on lesson up for 50 uh, uh, teachers and that one the, f- the first things that I was trying to apply was indeed that mind map to get that first uh, prior knowledge uh, immediately active and starting up the interactivity um, and due to the fact is that we have quite some different types of questions that you can add throughout the lesson uh, of course, that is really the way how a teacher throughout the lesson can really test out if uh, students understand what kind of information or knowledge uh, uh, the teacher provides. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I know lesson up fairly well. Um, for people that don't know uh, the power of lesson up, I, I guess is uh, Dan. You'll have to remind me how many teachers are using your site, but I know there's over one million lessons available, isn't there? There are, yes. And, and how many users? So that's quite a phenomenal number, isn't it? You know, that's a huge bank of resources a teacher can access straight away. How many yeah, there are indeed. Currently, I think we have over 35,000 teachers that use us actively on a monthly basis. Um, so they really come back like every day or every week. Um, and those are primarily based in the Netherlands, Belgium and in the UK. Mm -hmm. Uh, But of course we have, as I explained earlier, we have uh, teachers from all over the world slowly uh, starting to know Lesson Up. Uh, Also a small company, so uh, um, really trying to focus on teachers individually and really helping them further. Um, So far I think over 100,000 teachers have signed up. Um, Yeah, and as I said, over 35,000 actively using us on a on a daily, weekly basis. And and, and Sean, how long have you been using Lesson Up for? Um, It's hard to say exactly. I I would I would guess around 2019, around that time. Right, so before the pandemic. Okay, great. Yeah, and and just on that, I think it kind of future proofed me for the the pandemic because yeah, sure, it was a great thing to. I I was ahead of the curve. I felt. Yeah, you were. Yeah in terms of online learning it was perfect. so I, I guess as soon as the pandemic hit with lockdown you you just flipped over straight over yeah and it was really nice to be able to say to my students look it's business is, is normal guys you know we're just going to be meeting online but our lessons aren't going to be necessarily yeah. you know we do other things but primarily you know lesson up's a big big part of what we do mm-hmm. it's going to stay a big part and, and i think my students mm-hmm. found a lot of um reassurance and comfort Good. in that 
Uh, so I'm going to come back to Rosenstein, Sean, and I guess this is the money question for me is, how has the Rosenstein principles changed the way you teach? Um, so I guess it's intertwined with Lesson Up again, really, because I think what, what I found I was previously doing is I was creating resources, I was presenting, I was over-presenting, um, students were being allowed by me to be a little bit too passive, um, and then when it came to assessments, we would be learning for the assessment. And I think using Rosenshine and Lesson Up together has made the focus more on the here and now and learning in the lesson, uh, reinforcing in the lesson and building knowledge rather than, you know, here's a presentation, we're not going to think about it for a month and then somehow there's going to be a task. And I, I think I'd got quite lazy in my approach you know, as as a lot of teachers perhaps do, and mm -hmm. you know, not not through being lazy, but just not maybe thinking about outcomes enough. So I think you know, breaking things down, assessing knowledge, uh, and really increasing massively the contribution of each person in the class. That's probably mm -hmm. been the significant change. You know, that kind of checking the understanding of everybody. Yeah, it's a great point, that checking the understanding. So if for anyone that's listening that's read the original paper by Rosenstein, so it was actually produced on a typewriter in 1982, the, the, the coincidence is the, the phrase check for understanding features 17 times. I don't know if that's a coincidence that it ended up becoming 17 principles, but I, I find it um, interesting that's the most used phrase throughout the whole original research paper. Um, the next key question then, Sean, is how has it changed the learning of the kids in your classroom, the principals? Um, I think it's that idea that um, we we learn in the moment. That, that I, I got used to students kind of, if you sprung a surprise test, oh, I didn't know we needed to know this, or mm -hmm. I didn't know we needed to learn this. And I think it's made them really focus that the learning is every minute of that that lesson through uh, the daily practice, the reminders from the lesson, the small steps, the practice, the checking, the understanding. I think all of that is made the lessons like very active, very focused and with clear outcomes. I know where everyone is and the student themselves know. Yeah, that they, was my next question are. actually, because you mentioned earlier, you know, not lazy per se, but you know, being a bit more rigorous with the outcomes. How, how do you now know what, what's that kind of concrete evidence you have that the rose and shine, the lesson up type stuff is making a difference to teaching and learning and here's the data to back it up? Um, so I build all my questions, um, whether they're multiple choice, slightly longer questions, mind maps, I build them all in. So all the questioning that's going to happen is there and then you can access those results not only in the lesson but any point afterwards so i had a lesson today we did a task there was 60 percent accuracy that's straight in my favorites that becomes a starter question tomorrow or the next lesson um, yeah. because that that's not hit that 80 percent sort of accuracy rate um so um, and my students know all right we can we can park that one now for a mm -hmm. while we we've hit the the 80, 100%, and if we stay below it, you're going to keep seeing that question. And where does that 80 more. come from? Is that just what you're happier with, or does it something that comes from lesson up? Or I think that comes from the rose and shine. He talked about 80%. I use yeah. that as a, you know, it's, it's a fluid sort of thing. But once once I think most people have, have got something, move then on. I move on. Um, but even today, at one point, it was 100%. We happen, I happen to have that one again later on, and it had dropped because, right. you know, memory ebbs and flows yeah. in, a, in a lesson. Does, and yeah. So we need to revisit that next time. And then once, we, once we've got mastery, we move on. So there you go, folks, and um, people listening. Um, you know, it's really reassuring, Sean, to hear how you can kind of recite I suppose how what a difference it has made to your teaching and learning and you mentioned that outcome so Dan I'll come to you now um Sean teacher in the classroom lots of kids around him busy busy classroom environment he needs data fast rapid to use in the moment and to plan the next lesson I guess uh, in this audio context for a podcast how can you describe the kind of screen data that a teacher would see behind lesson? What, what would I be seeing? What data would be in front of me? How could I use it 
in the busy nature of a classroom to work out what to do next? Yeah, really interesting question, uh, Ross. I think uh, what we have since a teacher creates a lesson, um, teaches that lesson in the classroom or has the ability to share this homework. And the moment actually immediately that students join or in the live uh, lesson or ha are busy with creating their homework or uh, finishing their homework, those results are immediately put into into the lesson up uh, platform and are visible for the teacher. And basically what the teacher can see are, are three different areas. One is on a student level, so how did the student go through the lesson, which questions were right or wrong, accuracy, but also timings. Mm -hmm. So how long did a student, for instance, check out a specific slide? And also know that if there, for instance, was an interactive video there that lasted for three minutes, and the slide was skipped into like two seconds, then you immediately, of course, know that, um, the, software will that the slide yeah, yeah, literally. So that is basically on the student level. You can also see it more on the lesson level. So slides you can see, hey, how did my students mm -hmm. uh, process this? And what was the accuracy level that Sean was uh, talking about? Uh, I'm going to pop back uh, to Sean now and check. So Sean, in the classroom, when you're on your lesson up bits of software, um, what are you seeing on your teacher dashboard in the moment and, and kind of, you know, kids are asking you to do all sorts of things. Uh, tell, tell us, uh, give us an insight into what you can see and what you can do in that moment. So I think it works perfectly for me in that moment. So if it if it's a multiple choice, they all enter and you come up with the scores. You know, ten people got a hundred percent, nine people whatever, mm -hmm. um, and that that's recorded. If you want a slightly longer answer, I'll, I'll pose some thought provoking answers. Sometimes they'll type their answers in. They all appear as almost like cue cards on on my screen. And I can um, keep permanent records, take screenshots of those. Mm -hmm. um, I can pair people up to to contribute together. Um, you've you've got a record of of their answer, whether it's something you want to look at or whether it's just right or wrong or a drag and drop exercise. You've got a record of all of that in real time that you can kind of say, right, I need to talk about this right now because we've only got twenty percent right. I must have not been clear. Or, like I said, you could say, right, it's not quite 80, I'm going to add that. Or you might pick out a more extended answer that was really good and say, right, I'm going to talk about this answer because it's exactly the sort of thing that, that we need to do. Um, or we can compare answers if, if the children are a bit more brave. You know, here's, mm -hmm. here's an answer that's kind of right. Here's an, one that's slightly more refined. So you're, you're getting access almost to their... So their answers, but also their thought processes, those kind of metacognitions, you're seeing what, what's going on mm -hmm. in, in the moment. And it, it tells you and enables you to, to react in the moment, not a week later when you've marked books. I guess going books. back to that point, you know, where you mark books, it's two weeks later. The, the, the data online gives you that hard, concrete, scientific evidence, which you can use immediately. Dan, I'll pop back to you then. Um, what what's 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 next for lesson up so you've mentioned where you are number of users give us a sense of um what the plans are for lesson up and how a teacher listening to this podcast or a school leader you might want to introduce it into their school how could they get involved but tell us about the hopes first plans well hopes and plans first then um i think what we have currently is a very good basis you know um teachers can create lessons they have all types of questions, they have the reporting, they can share homework, they can conduct tests, and they have a huge library of already content ready for you, ready to use. Um, I think currently, or the upcoming steps for us are very important is that we can uh, suit or serve teachers better um, on their topic. So for instance, uh, Sean is more into the uh, psychology part. Um, how can we serve Sean with content, interesting content that has been created by other teachers um, or uh, professional content creators that we also have on our platform. How can we, sh can we serve Sean with better content so he can also be inspired again with everything that is uh, created on the lesson of platform. Um, I think that is one thing. The other thing is for us is really important to see is that teachers really like to try out lesson up, you know, as a first step. Um, but we also see that this is basically, um, this is quite a, 
kind of a different approach, especially if somebody is normally used to teach with a regular book or with just uh, a simple uh, quiz some, somewhere in between his, his or her lesson. Um, this is really a different approach. And uh, as I was uh, uh, telling earlier, um, this week we were in Belfast with a team to give master classes uh, also to uh, other teachers over there. And I was comparing it there with going from uh, an earlier Nokia to a brand new it's a different way of like using your phone the opportunities it has and you have to explore that and it isn't like a change from day or uh, day overnight mm -hmm. um, and I think what we need to do in the upcoming time is really support teachers in that change COVID of course has learned us a lot um, regarding teaching and regarding the importance of teachers in the whole uh, spectrum um, we're never going to say digitalization is going to take over. No, but it can really enhance teaching, support teaching, and really get the kids back engaged into the classroom. And that's what we try to do. So the aim for us is also really on creating the Lesson Up Academy to make sure that we can really support the teachers in the first few months of using Lesson Up to go that next step. Sure. Um so that, you know, the next step in that engagement, Dan, you mentioned, Sean, if I pop back to you, um, I've I got a bit of a multi-pronged question here. What advice would you give to teachers that aren't familiar with Rose and Shine, who might be working in a primary or in an FE setting, something different to your uh, current role, or someone who's a tutor or something like that? I guess that, you know, how, how could I use Lesson Up in those types of schools? Or if I work in those types of schools, how could I also use uh, uh, Rosenshine? So there's a kind of a, a six pronged attack there, different types of settings using the software and using Rosenshine. What would be your advice? So, so I think that the, the software lends itself to, to any setting really, I think, because um, what I found that's really helped for me that I think is very transferable is, is getting away from that kind of hands up so somebody answers so you get that one answer so across an hour lesson you might hear each kid speak or contribute once or twice um, and what lesson up gives everyone a voice you know so you have a class of 30 you pose a question you get 30 answers right away so 10 questions and last you've had 300 answers mm -hmm. so what I don't think it matters on the setting or the age because you know what we do is 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 kind of the same in that regard and it it, it doesn't need to be a um a private school with small classes it's it's giving every child that opportunity to answer and for you to see where that that child's at mm -hmm. and it just lends itself so perfectly to that and the way you can build lessons yourself or there, there's a there's so many available now and and that would um, just increase you can just then adapt you know that a lot of them have the content and then you can put your little flavor with the sort of questions they're very mm -hmm. quick and easy to create so you know all of a sudden you've got a, a version of taking lollipop sticks out of a glass that that just yeah. works so much better and so much more, more efficient isn't it more efficient, efficient and, time. you know you, you're just it, it goes it does go back to that checking your understanding you're checking the understanding of everyone in mm -hmm. pretty much every moment of that lesson. Yeah. So people are engaged and they're focused because you're not reining people in because you've not really lost them by over presenting in the first yeah, it's place. Such, it's such a good point. And, and what about the rose and shine? Uh, people not familiar with it. And if I was in a primary setting or an FE, uh, is it a transferable set of principles in your opinion? Yeah, I, I would think so. And I think like, like all initiatives, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. You know, how am I going to do all this on top of what, what else and I think it's just to see it as a journey um, as I have I haven't tried to kind of write all 10 in every lesson every time I've tried to build in daily review without fail I've tried to um, you know ask more questions think of the quality of the questions but I've still you know my targets I've got here provide more models that's that's for this next bit in the summer holiday and a um, mm -hmm. to, to build more scaffolds in, that's, that's the next step. So you, you pick the two or the three that you think, right, that, that's my goal for this term. Every, mm -hmm. every class is just going to have this daily review. And that, that, 
kind of daily review seems such a simple thing. And I think we, we kind of take it for granted that, you know, oh, I've taught it, the kids know it, but you, you have to teach something three, four, five times, you know, because it's, we forget that it's, yeah. everything's new to them. It's not new to us. So why can't, why aren't they getting it? No. You know? um, so that, you know, just pick some two or three simple ones, get used to that and, and then build. Some good advice. So uh, on the on the word build, I suppose, Dan, back to you. Um, kind of similar question to what I posed just to Sean, you know, uh, how, have you got primary teachers using your site? I know you've got people at Belfast Met College using it, so we've got an FE kind of context. I don't know I'll, what I shouldn't assume, because that's what Rosenstein doesn't recommend, so I'll check. Um, are secondary teachers using it too? Give, a, give us a kind of broad demographic so people that aren't using Lesson Up uh, if you've got loads of primary teachers using it, then if I'm a primary, then uh, I should sign up too. Yeah, but basically I think Sean mentioned it before as well. It doesn't really matter what type of teacher you are, but um, really what you can do with it. And as how Sean approaches the Rosenshine as well, you can easily also apply a lesson up in that sense. So what you can do as a starter, you can easily have like your PowerPoint uploaded, add some first interactive questions in there and boom, you go. Um, in terms of uh, uh, demographics, indeed, um, what we see a lot is that primary teachers start uh, mm -hmm. with Lesson Up, but mainly from a thing age 9 or 10, because if you want to really have the interactivity with uh, mm -hmm. a device uh, by a pupil or a student, um, yeah, you literally should have that age. We see a lot happening in secondary education and further education. Uh, and have you got a sense of, you know, set, uh, state school, independent sector, or is it kind of a big, big mix? Uh, that's a big mix. It doesn't really matter, actually. Okay. So that's um, good. So, um, yeah, so there you go, folks. Lesson up and rose and shine so the links will be included in the podcast and the video for you to check out a little bit more now i mentioned that was your last question chaps but um as we get past half an hour in my podcast we move over to a little quick fire quiz a bit of retrieval practice and uh i'm going to pose lots of quick fire questions to you know i don't want you to pause or hesitate i'm going to see if i can catch you out but i'll start off with some easy ones um so, so let's just start easy. So, uh, Sean, what, what's on your desk today? What, what, what's, what's on your to-do list? Um, my to-do list, um, walk the dog. It's okay. Been long, it's been a long week. Good. Uh, Dan, how about you? What's on the to-do list? Um, I think spending some time with my son this evening because I have been away uh, traveling a lot. So um, I think that's the most important one. Have dinner with the family this evening. It's Father's Day this weekend here in the UK. So that's a good message for myself, a good reminder for myself. And uh, you as well. Yeah, yeah so I'm up. We're off for an open water swim tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, OK, next question. Uh, Sean, what book are you reading? I'm reading a book about what happened to Freud's patients. All right, he fantastic. Ever the psychologist. <laughs> All right, Dan, how about you? Yeah, it's a bit uh, business related. I'm reading Fast Scaling, um, how to scale your company fast, but not like, go it into hyperscaling, you know, that it becomes a disaster. But um... I'm listening to an audible book, which I believe still counts as reading. Uh, it's called Connect by Simon Lancaster. And it's about he he writes public speeches for lots of big, important people. And he's just going through some of the kind of hallmarks of telling stories, which I think thinks interesting from a psychological perspective, but also useful for a teacher because we tell stories all the time. And in my life, you know, talking publicly speaking all to lots of big audiences. OK, next uh, question, Sean, a uh, piece of advice for a, a teacher wanting to get into Rose and Shine. Um, slow and steady wins the race. OK, Dan. Oh, we've lost your sound there. I would say this is a marathon, not a sprint. No, marathon, not a sprint. Okay, Sean, I'm going to assume you're doing your dream job, but if you weren't a teacher, what's that wacky career, you know, that you never had or never tried? What would it be? Um, coaching soccer at an American university. Okay, fantastic. Dan? Teacher. Teacher, okay. Uh, Sean, back to you. Uh, if we went to Hawaii for 24 hours, what would we do? Uh, surf. Okay, fantastic. All 24 hours. Dan, if we came over to The Hague uh, or to Amsterdam, what would we do for 24 hours? 
Uh, well, actually, you can serve here pretty good. I did it last week, so uh, so that's for sure. Uh, no, I would say uh, we explore a bit uh, downtown uh, Amsterdam and uh, The Hague for sure, but I would prefer The Hague because it has a bit more of a culture. A bit more culture. Uh, Sean, finish the sentence. If I was Education Secretary of State, I would... Change examinations. Uh, Dan, uh, we can do the, the Dutch or the British or the English, I should say, Education Secretary. Do you choose? Um, if I were the Dutch Ministry of Education, I would... Um, that's a good one. Um, oh, I've got you, I've got you. Yeah, indeed. Okay, <laughs> I, back to Sean, back to Sean. Biggest, uh, what's, your, what's your career achievement you're most proud of? Let's give it a shout out. Uh, creating a prep school from scratch. Wow, fascinating. Dan, how about you? Um, I would now say creating a company from scratch. That's uh, okay. that's really something. Great. Uh, uh, we're having a kind of creating something from scratch show off here. <laughs> uh, Sean, a couple more. Uh, who would you inter uh, recommend I interview next and why? Oh, gosh. Um, In education, ideally. Um, Williamson. Okay. Let's see if we can get hold of him. He's, he's done a runner at the moment, hasn't he? Uh, Dan, how about you? Yeah, I think that the uh, person you were referring to, so the Secretary of Education yeah. or the Ministry of Education. Okay. And um, final question, Sean. What's your favorite memory of a teacher, you know, that inspired you to teach? Yeah, I got in trouble for saying this at an interview once because it is a, a teacher that was maybe not the best practitioner, not the best technician, but was the just a really nice guy that kind of helped me out at a really difficult yeah, time. Yeah, emphasizes the importance of relationships in schools, yeah. doesn't it? Not necessarily being top of your game in the classroom. Uh, Dan, how about you, that teacher you remember? Well, my history teacher of uh, secondary school, which uh, really helped me to pass my exam. Uh, hey. And that's important as well. Uh, so there you go, folks. Ross here at Teacher Toolkit, um, joined by the delightful Sean Quinn, um, head of psychology, and Dan uh, Geeson, uh, founder of CEO, uh, CEO of Lesson Up. And I've got one last question for you to put you on the spot. Sean, what would you hope to be your legacy? Um, people thought that I cared. And Dan? Uh, legacy in terms of business, I would say helping as uh, much teachers as possible to really get engaged kids, even if it is without Lesson Up. Okay. So there you go, folks. Thanks for listening. I hope you've learned a few insights about Rosenshine, uh, the wonderful tech software Lesson Up, and some, uh, some interesting facts about Sean and Dan. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll be on the podcast soon. Uh, bye for now.